The United States population rose in the 1840s, especially with a substantial number of Irish and German immigrants. Migration westward, the growth of cities and towns, the advent of a transportation boom that included railroads, canals, and the telegraph, enticed Americans to seek new land and new opportunities. It seemed inevitable that Americans would expand across the continent. Journalists coined the term manifest destiny to describe this ordained expansion. This expansionist vision brought with it an ethical question. Will these new territories prosper on the backs of free or slave laborers? President James K. Polk was elected in 1844 to expand American territory. But whether slavery would be expanded remained unclear. American history students know what happened next. The United States annexed Texas in 1845 and Oregon in 1848. In between, we fought and won a war against Mexico. In the process, the West gained over 500,000 square miles of territory. Newspapers heralded our growth as the triumph of the Anglo-Saxon race. However, the actual story of how we came to acquire this land has intrigue far beyond the cursory mention high school history books give this war. Hi, I'm Tom Army. In this edition of U.S. History Online, we begin to explore the complex causes of the Civil War. We start in the 1840s. Did the idea of manifest destiny cause land grabs, such as Texas annexation? Or did the idea justify actions taken for other reasons? What caused the Mexican War? What role did racial issues play in President Polk's decision to declare war? Abel Upshur served as President John Tyler's Secretary of State between 1843 and 1844. Upshur, a slaveholding states' rights advocate, had proven himself a skilled and intelligent administrator while serving as Tyler's Secretary of the Navy. Beginning in 1843, Upshur advocated for the annexation of the Republic of Texas as a slave state. Texas had declared its independence from Mexico seven years earlier. In addition to advocating Texas annexation, Upshur was deeply involved in negotiations with Great Britain over an Oregon boundary dispute. Upshur feared British presence in the Oregon Territory. He also feared that if he were unable to secure the annexation of Texas, Great Britain would offer to annex Texas. The creation of a Texas Republic under British rule would end slavery. Britain could offer economic assistance to Texas and military protection from an invasion from Mexico. Such a realignment would threaten the security of the United States. To complicate matters, Mexico still believed the Texas territory belonged to them. Mexico never signed a treaty that recognized Texas independence. In the winter of 1844, Upshur had proposed a treaty with the Lone Star Texas Republic to entice them to join the United States. 
The Secretary of State had also employed his lobbying abilities to persuade two-thirds of the U.S. Senate secretly to pledge their support for annexation. Putting together these entangled agreements constituted a grand accomplishment. Tyler and Upshur, considered rogue Whigs, had joined the party for anti-Jackson reasons. Democrats, on the other hand, were also equally suspicious of both men for initially jumping ship and joining the Whigs. By Valentine's Day, 1844, Upshur had secretly negotiated a treaty to annex the Republic of Texas. He only needed to sell the plan to the Senate. Upshur appeared capable of completing this delicate task. Privately, he believed annexation would be good for the South and slavery. Publicly, Upshur spoke of annexation as an excellent benefit for the nation. He steered clear of any talk about slavery. Tyler also promised Texas that a daunting naval force would immediately arrive in the Gulf of Mexico when they signed the treaty. The U.S. would repel any Mexican invasion by land. Tyler's pledge, of course, was unconstitutional. Only Congress had the power to declare war. So Upshur countermanded the pledge before Congress discovered what he had pledged. Mexico, meanwhile, had started amassing troops near the Texas border. Upshur had skillfully navigated between the shoals of southern extremists and northern abolitionists to strike a deal. Moderates were intrigued. The success called for a celebration by the Tyler administration. So on February 28, 1844, the president, Abel Upshur, members of the cabinet, senators, and other luminaries gathered aboard the new steam frigate Princeton, the pride of the U.S. Navy, for a cruise on the Potomac. All would see for themselves the technological marvel of the frigate and its massive cannons dubbed the Oregon Gun and the Peacemaker. They planned the event as a glorious patriotic celebration of American ingenuity, scientific excellence, and financial might. As a former Secretary of the Navy, Upshur had played a significant role in the bolstering of this new Navy. The celebration would mark a proud day for him. Captured Richard Stockton had ordered sailors to fire the peacemaker. This was the longer of the two guns on the deck. And it was fired three times. After that demonstration, many guests retired with President Tyler below deck to enjoy champagne and a splendid feast. As the Princeton turned towards her anchorage, George Washington's Mount Vernon came in view. Thomas Gilmer, the new Secretary of the Navy, asked the captain for one final cannon discharge in honor of the nation's first president. At this point in the story, we must discuss a few details of cannon construction. The Oregon gun utilized a revolutionary built-up construction of reinforced wrought iron hoops wrapping around the breech. This iron wrapping increased the amount of charge the breech could withstand. Captain Stockton had ordered and designed the Peacemaker because he wanted two guns on deck. The peacemaker used old foraging technology, 
with thicker metal at the breech, but could handle less transverse charge force. The Peacemaker was fired three times. Still, Stockton chose it again for the extra firing. When a sailor pulled the cannon's lanyard, the gun exploded. Hot metal and shrapnel ripped across the deck. Upshur, Gilmer, and six others died instantly. Twenty people fell wounded. This terrible mishap changed the course of negotiations with Congress over the annexation of Texas. It put the country on a path towards war with Mexico. It appeared to accelerate a sectional crisis fermenting in the minds of many Americans. In the aftermath of the explosion, President Tyler selected John C. Calhoun as the next Secretary of State. That appointment proved an unfortunate choice. On April 22, 1844, Calhoun submitted the Texas Annexation Treaty to the Senate for closed debate. Anti-slavery Democrat Senator Benjamin Tappan of Ohio leaked the details of the treaty to the press. Next, the political giant Henry Clay and former President Martin Van Buren came out against the treaty. Three days later, April 27th, the Washington Papers published a letter from Calhoun to the British minister, Sir Richard Pakenham, stating that the annexation of Texas was essential to the security of the South and to the expansion of slavery. Calhoun called slavery a social good in his letter. Calhoun himself had leaked the letter. Recall that before his death, Secretary of State Upshur, a slaveholder, still understood his allegiance belonged to the nation and not to the South alone. The new Secretary of State, Calhoun, wanted publicly to force the Tyler administration to embrace slavery as a reason for Texas's annexation. Calhoun had created a new public awareness of the Texas Annexation Treaty. Both of the likely rising presidential candidates, Clay and Van Buren, promptly rejected Texas annexation. Northern Whigs and Democrats who had accepted annexation now opposed it. Calhoun's words alienated Northern support for the treaty and turned the issue into a sectional stalemate. Calhoun had blown the lid off the kettle. President Tyler continued, however, to work toward annexation. Historian William W. Freeling wrote that Tyler sought to annex, quote, Texas to outmaneuver suspected efforts by Great Britain to promote an emancipation of slaves. Unquote. President Tyler faced an uphill struggle. He would receive help, however, from many allies, and this would include the next president of the United States, James K. Polk. Few expected Polk to win his party's nomination, let alone the presidency. Nominated on the ninth ballot, Whigs jeered, who is James K. Polk? Well, they were about to find out. We'll pick up the story of President Polk's role 
in the next part of the Mexican War or the United States invasion.